Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from around the world. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be launching this month's uh, Global Brain Health Clinical Exchange. We'll be talking about opportunities in brain health uh, around the world. Um, we'll be hearing from Professor Ala Gert, um, who represents the WFN as a trustee. Um, and we'll also uh, be hearing from Diana Saylor, who's involved in the Zambia Neurology Program, and Dr. Melody Adukile, um, who's uh, involved in that program, but who is also uh, involved in teleneurology and in uh, improving access to neurology education uh, in that region. It would be great to hear where you're joining us from. It's great to know who we're talking to before we get started. Um, so please do um, put a note in the chat where you're joining us from, what you're interested in, um, whether you've joined us before. It's just great to know who's out there. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our chair today. So that's Professor Ala Gert. Um, she's a professor of neurology in the Russian National um, Research Medical University and director of the Moscow Research and Clinical Center for Neuropsychiatry. Um, she's also a trustee from the World Federation of Neurology. Is going to speak about the opportunities that they can provide today. So I'll hand over to you, Professor Gert. Thank you very much, Greta, and it's a great pleasure and honor to chair the session. Actually, it's my uh, second uh, time of chairing the session, and I'm really very much grateful to uh, Ben and to you. That's really a fantastic audience, a fantastic program. And I would say that it's a kind of a silver lining of COVID because it all started in COVID and then expanded to all the other areas of neurology. So thank you very much for doing it to you and your team. Uh, we have a fantastic audience and I know that the number of registrations was really record. I appreciate that not everyone can join, like, you know, we're in the middle of the very busy clinics and so on. However, we have an excellent uh, registration and I do hope most of the, uh, this excellent group will be able to join us. And we have fantastic speakers today. I'm very pleased and I feel honored to chair the session with such a fantastic speakers. We have Dr. Diana Saylor, who is uh, Diana. Can we uh, welcome you? Thank you very much for joining. Diana is a neuroinfection specialist and associate professor of neurology and director of the Global Neurology Program and Global Neurology Fellowship at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Diana has been living and working full time in Zambia as a director of the first and the only neurology postgraduate training program in Zambia. She also leads the only neurology inpatient neurology service in the country at the University Chick Hospital and his help has helped a lot and really her contribution to neurology in Zambia is fantastic. She helped to launch Zambia first teleneurology service and now another silver lining of COVID the increase of teleneurology globally. So Diana, we are very grateful to you for joining and we have a, a fantastic panelist today. Uh, may I ask to uh, welcome Dr. Melody Asukli. Uh, Melody, we can see you. Yeah, Melody, thank you for joining. Melody is a neurologist at the University at the University of Zambia School of Medicine in Lusaka, and remarkably, uh, Melody is one of the first Zambian neurologists. To tell the truth, I will stop the introduction for a moment, but when I started uh, training in neurology, I one of the examples of the country where there are no neurologists was Zambia. So, well, time flies and I'm happy that it's not the case anymore. And thank you very much, Melody, for that. Uh, she is an attending neurologist and lecturer at the University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka, Zambia. She has a special interest to epilepsy, like me, so we're in the same team, and recently completed a clinical epilepsy fellowship at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. She directs the National EEG Lab, and she's a tutor of the six-month online EEG course. 
And together with Professor Saylor, she helped to sell past air teleneurology clinic in Zambia, especially during COVID. So we have really a great team and a great audience. And I'm looking forward to the very successful uh, session today. So um, if I may, I think it's uh, in case some of our uh, members of the panel or our audience has a immediate urgent questions I'm happy to ask. If not, then I will try to present some opportunities from the perspective of the World Federation of Neurology. Uh, I'm sharing my slide just a moment. So first of all, uh, indeed, it's a great pleasure. And the World Federation of Neurology is doing really a lot for education, for care and training, and for improvement of service to neurology worldwide. I have no conflict of interest for presenting this uh, talk. And we will start with the, with some details about the WFN, the World Federation of Neurology, then the concept of brain health. I will very briefly give you the information about the World Brain Day. And then we will move to the intersectoral global action plan on epilepsy and other neurological disorders, IGAP, and we will finish with an outline of the educational opportunities in the WFN. So we will start with the WFN. And as you know, the World Federation of Neurology is the global organization, it's a federation of neurological societies. The mission of the WFN is to foster quality neurology and brain health worldwide. Uh, WFN has several subspeciality groups, and they definitely do not cover all the areas of neurology because there is an excellent partnership with major professional neurological societies like International League, League Against Epilepsy, like World Stroke Organization. And the areas which are not covered with these major societies are covered by the specialty groups. Also, the WFN has a regional structure, and there is an African Academy of Neurology, American Academy, you definitely know it, Asian and Oceanian Association of Neurology, European Academy of Neurology, Pan American and Pan Arab Union. Remarkably, the World Federation of Neurology is very active at the international arena, and uh, actually, I'm just came. I just came from Geneva, from the executive board of the World Health Organization, and we gave several presentations there. So, for many years, the World Federation of Neurology is the official non-state actor of the uh, World Health Organization. And two years ago, we also joined ECOSOC. And this is the Economical and Social Council at the UN. And this is the act, act, acting why ECOSOC is the only possibility for the non the member state, not the governmental organization, to have a direct impact of the UN. So we are proud of that. As I mentioned, the WFN has a lot of regional branches, a lot of member societies, over 120. I believe that's 124. And this is the slide from which was kindly given to me by Professor Waldron Grisold from Austria, who is the current president of the WFN. And as we are addressing to some part Africa, as you can see, a lot of African countries has the member societies joining the WFN. Actually, almost all, but still some are lacking. So we are looking forward to have more member societies from other parts of Africa. Now, let's come to the brain health. As you know, brain health is an emerging concept. And once again, we had a very productive meeting with Tarun Dua, who is a current uh, chair of the Brain Health Unit. And the Brain Health Unit at the WHO is a part of the Mental Health Department led by Deborah Castell. 
So the brain health, brain health concept actually uh, started to develop and to grow in parallel to the intersectoral global action plan on epilepsy and other neurological disorders. And I will not read my screen. You see that actually this concept uh, encompassed neural development, plasticity, functioning, and recovery. And there are numerous conditions. Most of them uh, have the other neurological conditions, but they also have some mental health component, like dementia, for instance. And this uh, represent, I think, the unity of the brain health with neurology and neuropsychiatry very much aligned and other conditions, comorbid conditions. So indeed, another notion is that brain health and that's extremely important, is a concept which emerged throughout the life course. And uh, the WFN has a very important meeting, a very important event, and this is the World Brain Day. As you can see in 2022, uh, immediately after the, or a year after the world, the uh, brain health unit at the WHO has been formed, we had the World Brain Day addressing brain health for all. And next, uh, the, one year after that, in 2023, we had the World Brain Day addressing disability and brain health. And now this summer on July 22nd, we will have the World Brain Day addressing prevention. And this is really a global event with the contribution of the WHO. And the whole day there are presentations, there are sessions in different parts of the globe. And it's, uh, I would see it as one of the major component of awareness that we can lead in order to make neurological disorders really a public health priority worldwide. The date is over fixed, it's July 22nd, so we're looking forward to a very active participation in the World Brain Day uh, this July, and this will be focused on prevention. As we're discussing the concept of the brain health, I would like to invite you to read this paper. This is a position paper of the World Health Organization and uh, both Professor Grisold and I significantly contributed to this position paper. It's addressing optimizing brain health across the life course. Uh, this is a really a uh, magnificent paper, and the concept of brain health is presented there. And what's important, as it is an official document of the WHO, you can use it in your awareness programs. You can uh, approach your Minister of Health asking for improvement of care, for funding, for allocation of resources to neurology in your country. Once again, this is an official document, and the WHO, uh, I would say, is quite uh, important and influential, especially to numerous uh, low- and middle-income countries. So I really invite you to read it and to use it as much as possible. And now we're coming to the major document. It's really a very victorious and very important documents. It's an unprecedented opportunity for neurology globally. And that's the intersectoral global action plan epilepsy and other neurological disorders. I would start with this Chinese proverb that a journey of thousand miles begins with a single step. And indeed, this action plan did not happen by chance, but came at the end of the very long journal, journey that involved the hard and really tireless work of many dedicated individuals across the globe. You can see the document itself. It's a brochure just published uh, by uh, the WHO. And this Chinese proverb was there. Uh, was we used it when we published the first paper on the global campaign to global commitment. It's the resolution that was a very important predecessor of the action plan, and it happened in 2015. But uh, the whole concept started early, and I invite you to pay tribute to these four people. That's Professor Ted Reynolds, 
who was the president of the International League Against Epilepsy in 1997, Professor Shishuli, who was at that time the chair of the executive board of the WHO, Ms. Haneke de Boer, the chair of the patient organization of epilepsy, and Dr. Leonid Prilipko, a very important person in the mental health department of the WHO. So uh, these four people actually are uh, based on their uh, desire of the epilepsy community to make epilepsy a public health priority. And with the understanding that really epilepsy is the most vulnerable, patients with epilepsy are really probably the most vulnerable in terms of stigma and discrimination. And epilepsy as the neglected disease for thousands of years was really uh, their uh, probably most uh, I would say, uh, crying about the inequality in urology. So epilepsy was uh, the driving force behind this concept. And the, con the epilepsy out of the shadow was the global campaign, very much supported by the World Health Organization. So it started and the next remarkable step happened in 2015 and as you can see there is again again an epilepsy group uh, which uh, advocated for the resolution on the global burden of epilepsy and the need for the coordinated action so it was a kind of the blueprint for the action plan but unfortunately it was just the resolution it has no indicators no uh, timelines no i would say uh, impactful tools for the implementation which could be respected by the member states and the idea of having the action plan uh, again at that time dominated by the epilepsy community uh, became very global and we had a remarkable side event official side event at the 72nd uh, World Health Assembly and over 120 participants from 40 member states uh, supported the idea of the action plan on epilepsy. And at that time, once again, the International League Against Epilepsy, International Bureau for Epilepsy, and the World Federation of Neurology were very important official contributors. And many member states supported it. Member states, it's a country in the language of the World uh, Health Organization. Another important document, once again, from the epilepsy perspective, was the uh, document, the report, Epilepsy as a Public Health Imperative. And once again, it gave an, ex an excellent blueprint for the global neurology, and epilepsy was a really entry point for neurology at that time, and still it's the same for until now. Uh, if you want to read about all this story and about all the challenges we had to overcome, this is a paper we published in Epilepsy, The Road to the World Health Organization, Global Action Plan on Epilepsy and Other Neurological Disorders. And in 2020, right uh, before the pandemic, it was actually the last face-to-face -face meeting of the executive board before pandemic. There was an initiative by a WFN, by European Academy of Neurology, by a number of member states to make this action plan broader. And the epilepsy community reacted very positively because indeed epilepsy is a part of neurology. So from that time, the resolution of the executive board started to be called the resolution for the EPSL action plan on epilepsy and other neurological disorders. That's actually what we have now. Once again, the WFN promoted it very, very significantly. And as you can see, there were papers in the world neurology. There is an excellent integration with the European Academy of Neurology, American Academy of Neurology. And as you can see, this was the draft resolution proposed to the World Health Assembly, and it was unanimously adopted. And this was the event per se uh, in May 2022. It was the virtual meeting uh, with the board definitely present of the World Health Assembly, but most of the member states joined remotely. So many non-state actors, including International League Against Epilepsy, World Federation of Neurology, 
a number of others significantly supported their action plan, this resolution, and more than 116 countries spoke in favor. So I was, it, I would say it was really a, a very remarkable. It was a milestone in the global neurology. And that's, as you can see, that's what happened. The president spoke in favor. I was there at the uh, hall, but it was really a remarkable event. The IGAP Intersectorial Global Action Plan is a powerful document. And once again, I invite you very much to present it to your government healthcare providers. And this is an official document addressing the member states uh, mostly. It has a vision and a goal. And uh, just to uh, highlight that each uh, each concept, each part, each uh, paragraph of the action plan is addressing what the WHO should do, what the member states should do, and what the global society, the non-state actors should do. So there are actually three laws in all the paragraphs of the action plan. And importantly, it has five strategic objectives to raise policy prioritization and strengthen governance, to provide effective, timely and responsible diagnosed treatment and care, implement strategies for promotion and prevention and foster research and innovation and strengthen informational system. And uh, another strategic objective is uh, focused on epilepsy to strengthen the public health approach to epilepsy. And I will walk you through the following slides very quickly, but importantly, you can see that each strategic objective has several targets. And these targets are very detailed, they are numerical, and that's the difference between the resolution and the action plan. Each target should be monitored by the WHO, and all the member states are obliged to report back to the WHO about the implementation of these targets. As you can see, there are two targets for strategic objective one, once again, two targets for the strategic objective two, and that's well published, that's why I, I think I can skip them. Importantly, uh, there are two targets to the strategic objectives for promotion and prevention. And the WHO insists that by 2031, 80% of countries have at least one functional inter intersectorial program for the brain health. So that's a request to the from the WHO to your member states, to your governments, and you can just uh, approach again the governments asking to fulfill the action plan provided by the WHO. Once again, there is a global target for the strategic objective for advising to collect and report on the core set of indicators for neurological disorders. And I don't think that you have detailed epidemiological picture of all the neurological disorders in your countries. It actually it's lacking even in the majority of countries. And that's the background for all the interventions. And there are two specific targets for epilepsy as well. Now, another very specific uh, difference from the resolution is the set of indicators. And this is the indications for measuring progress for the implementation of IGAP. So once again, the countries are obliged to report back to the WHO about the implementation of IGAP and meeting the indicators. And in fact, the IGAP is a unique opportunity for neurology across the globe. And this is the paper in the Journal of Neurological Science. And it is very much in line of the concept of the brain health. And my final couple of slides, are dedicated to education in the WFN. And that's a kind, I will start with a very personal comment. Actually, my journey to neurology was very much, uh, I would say, impacted by Professor Ted Monsat, who at that time, at the end of uh, 1990s and the beginning of 2000, was the elected trustee of the WFN and he chaired the educational committee. And he collected a group of young neurologists at the time 
and we were educational coordinators in globally and in our countries. And actually, his impact and his dedication to education was fantastic. And he was a, an excellent mentor to him. Uh, I uh, paid tribute to him until, like, you know, every day. So once again, the mission of the WFN is to foster quality neurology and brain health worldwide. But as you can see at the website, the goal is to achieve it by promoting global neurological education and training. So WFN is very much focused on education and there are educational programs, training centers, department visits, grants, educational days, continuum programs and awards. And just in the interest of time, I invite you to visit the website and actually, it's a very detailed characteristic of all the educational programs, including continual program, which is being provided in collaboration with the American Academy of Neurology. There are numerous tra training centers. There are a lot of other activities. So indeed, there are a lot of opportunities for your career development in parallel with the, or leveraging the opportunities for neurology provided by the WFN. So with that, I would like to thank you again for your kind attention, and I will stop here. Um, I wonder whether, um, Adam, from the Global Health Network, may we launch the, those three polls, and then we'll just very quickly, uh, and then we'll go on to uh, Dr. Saylor. Thank you. Excellent. Please uh, complete these polls and we will have a kind of the understanding whether you know about the World Brain Day, about the IGAP and the Sectoral Global Action Plan, and are you aware of the educational program or provided by the WFN? Well, Prapala, it does look like the poll results are up now. Do you want to go over them? Okay, good. And in terms of their uh, World Brain Day, Yes, it's excellent that we have, first of all, we have 90 participants now and 60% have heard about that. So I hope that you will be participating this uh, summer. Uh, regretfully, and that's actually very similar to what we got from other sources. Uh, the majority of neurologists don't know about a gap. And... Well, the good news is that 30%, almost 30% know about that. Please use it. Once again, it's an official document. It's published at the website of the WHO, so you can use it and please at least read it. It's quite a powerful document. And uh, I don't see the third question. Just a second. Yeah, okay. So please use and leverage on the WFN educational programs. They are developed for you, and I hope you can uh, enhance your career and professional development based on this program. Thank you very much. And now it's my really great pleasure to uh, give the floor to Dr. Diana Saylor. And Diana will present her star case studies from Zambia Neurology Training Program and how it was implemented and describe the challenges and successes. Diana, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Prof. Um, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thanks to the host for inviting me to present on our experience in Zambia developing neurology training. Um, I'll try to keep this brief so we make sure we have lots of time for discussion in the end. So please do think about your questions um, and please put them in the chat even as I present. So um, before we get started, um, I'm just curious if you think about your home country, I'm wondering how many neurologists you have in your home country. So hopefully a poll will be launching soon and we'll get some feedback about um, kind of people's current situations. All right, so it looks like a pretty good mix. So um, everybody comes from a country with it, at least one, it seems like, but still um, half of our attendees, over half, um, have less than 100 neurologists in the country. And so presumably, far fewer neurologists than what are needed for the population. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned, that was sort of the, the situation where we were starting in Zambia. 
just to orient you, um, Zambia is this country in red in central southern Africa. It's a country of about 20 million people where three quarters live on less than a dollar a day. Its HIV prevalence among adults is about 12%, making it the seventh highest HIV burden in the world. It's also one of the WHO 30 high TB burden countries in the world as well. Um, and these are quite old numbers, but the proportion hasn't changed so much. Um, it has about a third the recommended number of doctors. Um, and when I came to Zambia in 2018, six years ago, there were four expatriate neurologists in the country, three of whom were predominantly doing research, one who was uh, mostly clinically based, and there were no Zambian neurologists at all. Um, and so I set about launching Zambia's first um, neurology training program for postgraduates or so residency program at the University Teaching Hospital, which is in the capital city of Lusaka. It's the largest hospital in Zambia. It has 1,655 official beds, so it's quite a massive hospital, but that doesn't include patients in the hallways or the aisles um, or elsewhere. It's also the national referral hospital, so patients are transferred from across the whole um, country to be seen here. And it's the primary teaching hospital in Zambia. There's no inpatient neurology service when I arrived, and neurology patients were cared for on internal medicine services. Um, but yet, what we needed to actually start a neurology training program was largely present. There are two CT scanners um, on the campus, at least one of which is usually functioning. We do have a nice 1.5 Tesla GE MRI scanner on our campus. Um, unfortunately, it's sort of sporadic day to day, week by week, whether it's functioning or not. But um, the neurologist who had come before me had established an EEG lab as well as an EMG lab. Um, and then, of course, we had the basic supplies, at least to do a lumbar puncture, although we didn't have fancy um, lumbar puncture kits like you find in a lot of European or American hospitals we tend to use IV cannulas to do lumbar punctures. And then the laboratory support for the CSF that we obtain is quite minimal. We don't have viral PCRs available um, and we have some challenges with a lot of additional CSF diagnostics. This is just a picture of our medical wards. We have, um, these are the three female medical wards. They're each about 50 beds each. And then there's a mirror image of um, three different male medical wards of similar sizes as well. This is a picture from inside the ward. So you can see that um, the people you can actually see here are not patients, they're bedside caregivers. Um, these are generally family members who sit at the patient's bedside 24 hours a day to provide care that might be considered nursing care in some places. So they're generally responsible for dressing, bathing, toileting, oftentimes turning patients, feeding patients, um, because our nurse to patient ratio is um, quite low. So a nurse may be taking care of 12 patients um, or sometimes at night even more, maybe even 30 or 40 patients. And so we really rely on family members to provide a lot of the basic care. Um, this is a picture on our um, rounds once the neurology training program was started. So you can see this is Dr. Mashina Chamba, um, who was one of Dr. Asukili's um, classmates and first graduates of our program. You can see we're joined by medical students, visiting residents from the U.S. often, internal medicine residents rotating with us. All of our um, medical records are paper-based, and we have a lot of challenges. You know, we have two physiotherapists for all of the medical wards. We have no occupational therapists, no speech therapists. Our drugs are limited. Um, generally, as far as the easily available seizure medicines, we have phenobarbital and carbamazepine. Um, others are available in the private sector, but often out of reach for our patients. We often don't even have diazepam for patients in status. So there are um, definitely a lot of challenges. And you know, I think some days you feel like you're fighting an ostrich with a chair, but the truth is that there's a lot of opportunities and we've persisted and really changed the face of neurology in Zambia. So before I tell you more about the program itself, um, I just wanna pause and ask if you have a postgraduate neurology training program, meaning either specialist training or a neurology residency in your country. All right, and so the majority are um, from countries where there is at least neurology training available, which is great, but we still have a quarter of people on the call 
um, without the opportunity to train to be a neurologist, at least in their home country. And that was the situation in Zambia in 2018 when I arrived, but we launched the neurology training program, which was structured similarly to other internal medicine subspecialty programs in the country. So our residents do three years of dedicated internal medicine um, training, and then their final two years are 100% um, spent on time training in neurology. I designed the program to be a blend of traditional Zambian postgraduate training as well as traditional U.S. postgraduate training. And by that, I mean that in Zambia, um, postgraduate training is actually a master's de de degree program. So there's formal courses, formal assessments. Um, our residents take written exams, oral exams, clinical exams. They get um, grades for different courses throughout their training. Um, and as a result, there's a really strong emphasis, emphasis on a formal didactic curriculum and protected time for the residents to learn, um, which was not necessarily the case where I trained in the U.S., where oftentimes patient care interrupted your one hour a day when you were supposed to be learning. Um, but on the same time, I thought one of the strengths of my training in the U.S. was really an emphasis on clinical bedside teaching and clinical reasoning. And that was something I endeavored to bring to our training program as well. And then I was also just really aware that we were training the first generation of Zambian neurologists. And so we intentionally created an academic and research focus with opportunities to both learn and undertake research um, during training. And our residents and graduates have really excelled and gotten um, uh, grants, independent grants to continue their research. They've published papers and presented at national and international conferences. So this is just putting um, some human faces. This was our first day of neurology training back in September of 2018. Um, this was celebrating the end of the first year of our training. And then probably the proudest day of my professional life in the midst of COVID in 2020, when our first six graduates graduated, you can see Dr. Asikile here on the right as well. And so since 2018, when we launched, we've now graduated 12 neurologists. These are 10 adult and two pediatric neurologists. We have seven um, current trainees. These are six adults and one pediatric neurology trainees. Our first six graduates are all serving as junior faculty within the program. And then just this year, I think most excitingly, our most recent six graduates have been relocated to other hospitals across Zambia to begin neurology services. So we have graduates at another hospital within Lusaka, but now we also have graduates in two other provinces as well. So really expanding access to neurological care throughout the country. And in the past year, we've also really started to see a regional impact. So a year ago, we had two postgraduate international trainees join us, um, one from Liberia. And when he finishes the training, he'll go back to Liberia and be the first neurologist there. And then one from Tanzania, and, and he's planning to go back to the Southern Highlands regions of Tanzania, and he'll be the first neurologist in that area, which has a population of 19 million people. And then we're excited that next month in February, we'll have a trainee joining us from Ethiopia to begin his two years of neurology training as well, with hopefully trainees from Uganda and Malawi joining us soon too. So um, this is just a brief roadmap of how we've done it, and I look forward to more conversations in the panel discussion. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Diana. And like, you know, I really admire from the bottom of my heart, I really admire what you are doing. It's fantastic. So it's yeah. fantastic. And I wish you all the success. Um, we have an excellent uh, faculty. And um, first of all, uh, I would like, uh, and thank you very much for uh, putting questions in the chat. I may just uh, ask Melody to comment. And I think you are the best possible person to comment the development of education and neurological care in Zambia. Thank you so much, Prof. And thank you so much, Diana, for, for that presentation. Um, yes, yeah, so I think the first thing to say is over the years, we've had Zambians who've trained in neurology, but I guess the biggest issue is They've left the country and trained outside, trained in environments and in situations that are so different 
that when you come back to your own country, first, it can be very difficult to integrate yourself. And then other times you then get better opportunities as well, say to continue um, working in Europe or in the US. So I really appreciate this idea of bringing training back to the region. And so I think that's the first thing that as Zambia we would encourage and would like to demonstrate is that as Africa particularly, we should be thinking about regional training centers of excellence where we can then promote regional exchange. And so one of the things we can look at in this case, we've shown how we are bringing in colleagues from other countries to do neurology residency, but we can also expand this in other areas. And I think we've seen that with the WFN as well, where for example, um, in Cape Town and in Cairo, they've got regional training centers which can then be more specific. So say regional training centers for epilepsy or for neuromuscular disease. And that way as well, you get training from people who, who are in the same environment. So you're looking at similar diseases, you're looking at similar populations, and you're looking at similar resource limitations. And so it gives you that opportunity to then come back home and easily implement a lot of things as opposed to perhaps being in a foreign environment. Though we cannot run away, of course, from the benefits of um, seeing more developed um, um, environments as well, but it's also really useful, mm -hmm. I think, to be able to train locally. We've also seen um, other examples, as I said, apart from the WFN, the pediatric um, fellowships do that very well. So there's the African Pediatric Fellowship Program where they do regional specialist training for pediatrics and particularly in neurology. They do that in Cape Town. So I think that's something to encourage is as we grow as Zambian, like in Zambian neurology, in African neurology, we the African neurologists should then train other African neurologists and they can learn from us and in our environment. The other thing I would like to say, Prof, is other opportunities of learning. So I think one thing that I've learned in my experience is how we can harness virtual education to expand our reach and training. So for example, like you mentioned the EEG online training course that I do, we identified in Cape Town that there are very few um, specialists in EEG, very few people who can actually read or teach EEG, but then we can expand that small faculty and get and allow access to a wide group of people. So I think harnessing virtual education is also something that as low resource countries, we should really focus on. We are doing this in Zambia. We are recording our lectures and uploading them on an online platform, which is Bumedi, and that's free access if you register. And so it's not only our institution that's there, but you've got lectures from the US, you've got lectures from Europe, from a wide range of institutions. And so in your own country, you might not have a neurology program, you might not have a neurologist, say specialized in a particular field, but you can get access to training through virtual programs. And I think this is, a COVID has taught us, and this is how we should think um, in terms of Africans in resource limited settings, how can we be innovative? As Diana showed her innovation in developing our program, how can we be innovative and think differently about training in our setting, given the resources that we have? Thanks. Thank you very much. And you and Diana proved that, you know, Mission Impossible can happen and can be a very successful possible mission and very important. Uh, so I would just um, address a couple of your uh, comments. Uh, first of all, I could not agree more, and I think you and Diana are the best persons to discuss it, that further development, further career development and continuous medical education is essential. And it's great that you started to think about that now. And by the way, there are a lot of opportunities provided by the WFN and a lot of opportunities provided by other organizations. For instance, I also am I'm the treasurer of the International League Against Epilepsy, and there are a lot of programs. So, well, definitely Melody and Diana knows that. But I'm uh, inviting all our participants, please go to the website. Please go to your chapter. Please go to a member society of the WFN, and you will definitely find the opportunity of the online, offline training, and there are a lot of programs that 
are being supported by all these organizations in Africa. Uh, the second comment is, uh, and then I will give the floor to Diana and to Melody. There was a very important question about the inter intersectorality and indeed a very good comment on the neuropsychology and so on. I think that deserve a very special meeting as I already addressed the comorbidities and at the meeting of the, at the Congress of the World Federation of Neurology where uh, me, we were meeting with the psychiatrist, and actually for me, it's very, very dear to my heart as I'm director of the Center for Neuropsychiatry. But uh, the intersectorial global action plan is that's why it's intersectorial. And all the stakeholders, I'm trying to use the language of the WO, WHO, I invited to contribute. And now the WHO is developing a toolkit for the implementation and WFN supported this significantly. And then we already saw the first version of the toolkit. It will be soon published. And the intersectorality and the need of collaborative strategies is very much addressed there. So I could not agree more that without the interdisciplinary approach and the integration between different specialities, we will not be as successful. And I would like to address another question that was very, I think, very good in the chat. Uh, the need for the neurology programs in nursing parallel to subspeciality training. And once again, may I invite Diana and Melody to comment on that. Diana? The question sure, in the sure. chat, need for yeah. neurology. Yeah, so I couldn't agree more. Um, we've actually had very recent experience with this. Um, we've been focusing a lot on improving stroke care in Zambia. And what we saw was that just by training neurologists, we reduced in-hospital stroke mortality by half. So we went from about 45% to about 24% mortality just by introducing the neurology training. But then for five years, our inpatient mortality stayed at 25% um, without budging. And we really realized that that was because the gains that could be made by training neurologists had been made. And what really needed to happen was to train the other healthcare workers. Um, and so just last September, we um, trained the first 30 stroke nurses in Zambia and started a nursing-based stroke unit at our hospital. And we've seen mortality fall to less than 10% by giving them the skills and training. Um, and it's really things like mobilizing patients, preventing aspirations, swallowing assessments, um, elevating the head of the bed, things like that, really, really generalizable um, um, interventions that we are also hoping move out of the stroke unit into the general medical wards and can benefit our non-stroke neurology patients and other um, medicine patients as well. So absolutely, I think, unfortunately, it's hard to take on everything all at once, but I think that um, ideally both of those things need to happen. Thank you very much, Diana. Melody, your comment. Thank you. Um, I don't have much to add to Diana, but I agree um, completely as well. And I agree with the comment on a multidisciplinary approach. I think as neurologists, we firmly believe in that. We also, though, recognize the, the limitations. So just as there are very few neurologists, there are very few physiotherapists in our country. We don't have speech therapists in state. We don't have occupational therapists. So you aspire for things, but it can be, it's a slow process. So we go step by step. We first do what we have. We use the tools and the personnel that we have. And then when we start advocating, we say, look, these patients are getting better. They could even do better if we had speech therapists, they could even do better if they had occupational therapists. So I think that is our goal and that's what we firmly believe, but we're trying to first strengthen the systems that exist. And then hopefully we can expand so that we have the full set of personnel that we need in the end. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, and probably the last question before I give the floor back to Greta, as an access to quality new or quality education in neurology. And as we can see from the chat, it's highly relevant, not only from your country, from Zambia, but to other countries. So what would you suggest to en enhance the access 
for even good for and specifically good quality education. Once again, Diana. I think I don't have much to add based um, above what Melody has said. You know, I think that thinking about using virtual learning and access to high quality virtual learning through the WFN, through Cape Town's EEG program, through our Zambia Neurology Lecture Series and others. Um, and then, you know, our um, what we're hoping with training international trainees is that it becomes sort of a hub and spoke model. So these national trainees come to Zambia, return to their home countries, but don't just go there to practice. We hope that they'll also start training programs then in their home countries, and we can support them as sort of the more senior um, training program. And with our online lecture and curriculum, we can sort of be the didactic curriculum for those training programs. And then the trainees that have gone back to their home countries can do their bedside teaching and the clinical work of the programs. And so in that way, we hope that we'll facilitate kind of sister training programs throughout the region that can really help to um, increase um, uh, access as well. Thank you, Melody. Um, thanks, Prof. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, that's as Diana has said, and as I said before, maybe to add was, well, I did mention it in my comment earlier is um, apart from where we are having the, a regional center or a center in a certain country to also identify within our region, like which center say is good at a particular specialty. And so someone can have their basic training in their country and then perhaps go for an exchange for three months or six months to the soil in a certain skill, EEG or learn EMG. So I think that as well is, is sustainable. It's a cheaper option and you're also learning in a similar environment. So I think that's something that would be really useful to improve access. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to thank you for what you are doing. And that's really phenomenal. And thank you for sharing your experience. I think it's extremely important and relevant for all the audience. Uh, second, please leverage on all the opportunities which are provided by the WHO. And there is an uh, office of the WHO in many countries so you can approach them and invite and include them in your awareness program. And also please use all the opportunities provided by the WFN, EN, uh, American Academy of Neurology, International League Against Epilepsy. I think every all the organizations are happy to support. And please ask, please don't hesitate to ask. I think that's also very important for teachers, for trainers, for some resources, for medication. I think it's important. And uh, once again, I, I appreciate very much the questions. And I would like to thank again, uh, Professor Michael and Greta and all the team, Liverpool team, for the excellent opportunity for sharing our your work and the work that has been provided and so successful. Thank you very much. And back to Greta. Thank you, Ala. I mean, it really is amazing to hear about the progress that you've made in Zambia and the way that you're now expanding that. Um, amazing statistics as well. Um, or just two final opportunities from us. Um, if you would be able to answer just one uh, final poll um, before we share the last two opportunities, uh, we want to understand whether these sessions are having an impact um, on you in your setting um, and whether this, there are things you take back. So if Louis from, or Adam from the Global Health Network, if you could launch this final poll. Um, so we, we'd like to just ask you, you know, is there one thing that you might do differently based on what you've said today? You know, have, have you thought about how neurology training could be done differently in your setting? Um, have you kind of listened to Dr. Zukili and thinking about whether there's ways to virtual, do virtual education? Um, and would you think you'll use the knowledge you've learned today um, and share it with your colleagues or your patients? Um, so I... Adam or do we have how many responses have we got? Are you happy to share the results? Yeah, we got 35%. I yeah. think it's, uh, it's it's fairly uh I think it's clear when I share that it's uh... okay, fantastic. Oh well that's brilliant. Thank you. Um I'm really pleased. That's really positive. Um 
thank you. And if anyone's willing to write in the chat something that they've learned or might do differently, that's great. Um, so I'll just take us. So the first thing is our, we've got a neuro research uh, resources center. So we're trying to compile um, resources that people can use to support healthcare and to support research related to clinical neurology. Um, some of these are educational tools, some of these are clinical practice guidelines, some of these are research tools. Uh, and the idea is to try to improve our collaboration and improve the consistency between different regions. And there's a QR code to link to that there. Uh, secondly, we had a joint session last year with the Global Brain Health Institute, uh, and annually they, re they recruit fellows, and these are one-year paid fellowships, uh, either in the USA or in Ireland, and they're looking for people with an interest in global uh, in brain health. They're incredibly intersectoral. They have, it's not just medics, it's not just healthcare professionals, it's, they have musicians, they have people from all sorts of, um, kind of walks of life. Um, so please do have a look. They'll be recruiting again in the summer. And then finally, this is our uh, next session on the 23rd of February. The QR code is there if you want to register. And I suspect we'll also be putting a link in the chat. Um, I'm also going to take back to our team about if there's a way we can organize certificates. I saw some comments in the chat about that. Um, so let me uh, kind of go back and think about how we can orchestrate that. And again, we'll be talking about uh, Cryptococcus. Uh, we've got some really excellent um, experts uh, and we can't wait to join you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to our chairs, uh, to our speaker and to our panelists. It's been a really excellent session and thank you for everyone to joining us and contributing uh, and hopefully see you next month. Thank you. Thank you very much.